continuación vamos a escuchar la ponencia a cargo de eh, Eugene Joe, eh, re, referida a los planes de gestión de una manera global. Agradecemos muchísimo eh, a Eugene su presencia aquí. Hoy es eh, la cara internacional dentro del, del encuentro. Y, eh, bueno, ha venido desde, desde Roma para estar aquí estos días con nosotros y ofrecernos esta visión panorámica eh, acerca de cómo se entiende eh, la gestión de los sitios patrimonio mundial eh, desde UNESCO. Todos tenemos eh, ideas, obviamente, de cómo hay que hacerlo, pero nos parecía muy interesante que alguien representante de ICROM, de, una, de este organismo especializado en la conservación de los bienes, nos pueda ofrecer esa visión eh, concreta eh, y cerrada de, de cómo podemos enfrentarnos a, la, a los planes de gestión. Paso a presentar a Eugene, que es directora del Programa de Liderazgo del Patrimonio Mundial, eh, UICN y CROM, desde 2017. Es un programa de desarrollo de capacidades que tiene como objetivo mejorar las prácticas de gestión conectando la cultura y la naturaleza mediante un enfoque centrado en las personas. El programa se centra en áreas de gestión eficaz, resiliencia y evaluaciones de impacto. Eugene fue punto focal nacional para Patrimonio Mundial en Corea durante nueve años e investigadora independiente antes de trabajar en ICROM. Tiene una licenciatura en Historia de Corea, una maestría en Estudios de Patrimonio Cultural y doctorado en Estudios del Patrimonio Mundial. También se desempeñó como relatora en la decimoctava Asamblea General de Convención de Patrimonio Mundial en 2011 y en la cuadragésima sesión del Comité de Patrimonio Mundial en 2016. Cuando quieras, Eugene, puedes empezar. Thank you very much, Laura, and uh, very good morning to all of you. And I especially have to thank uh, for the provision of the interpretation services, which I realize it's only for the benefit of me. <laughs> so thank you very much. I would like to very much thank for the invitation uh, to be able to participate today uh, at the Spanish Site Managers Forum. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to meet all of you all in one go, whereas it would have been very difficult to have uh, all the possibility to meet with different from all different people from more than 50 sites all, in once, all at once. So I gratefully thank the Minister of Culture for their kind invitation, uh, Culture and Sports, sorry, and the Director General of the, the Madrid City for uh, allowing me to also take part in this event. Uh, it was a very beautiful walk this morning and uh, it didn't feel real to be walking in a park, to be coming into work, so that was fantastic. Um, I also have to remark that the 17th edition of a site manager's network meeting is not an easy thing to achieve. Uh, one of the most frequent questions that I get from different countries and from different regions is actually how do we go about start having these kind of networks between site managers. And as you know, uh, the World Heritage Site Managers Forum that took place in Riyadh uh, was only go it's only going through its fifth edition. It took 40 years for the World Heritage Convention to realize that we didn't have a site managers forum for uh, site managers at the global level when uh, the convention had been going on for 40 years. And it only started in 2017. And um, So it's, uh, it's actually a great wealth of knowledge and experience that you have in Spain that you can share with other countries, with other regions, I think, just on the benefit of having these regular meetings, being able to know all the people around, being able to know what is going on, even if you don't attend uh, directly all these different meetings or different, uh, different workshops that go around at the global level, being Being able to keep up with the different trends, but also sharing experiences is absolutely fundamental. And I really wanted to applaud uh, Spain for their continued efforts uh, on, on reconvening these occasions. So thank you very much. And I also have to say that the whole spirit of the initial speech that was given at the inauguration, talking about people-centered approaches, that, that World Heritage needs to remain relevant. It needs to stay alive to the people and to the communities that live around them is absolutely fundamental in its, in its essence of where we're headed towards management. So I will be mostly talking about that during my uh, presentation. Uh, just a very quick note on ICROM. Um, we are the lesser known <laughs> of the advisory bodies as we all uh, are very much um, knowledgeable about ECOMOS and IUCN because of nominations. Uh, ECROM doesn't take part in nominations. We actually are there after 
the sites are inscribed. So we are here to provide assistance, technical uh, support uh, on management, on any conservation, uh, research, so on and so forth. Uh, we are a member state organization, so governments have to become uh, members of ECRAM, and currently we have 137 member states, and we p uh, participate with, uh, we collaborate with more than 450 organizations and institutions worldwide. So mostly we uh, work on capacity building, on training, on study research, uh, information uh, dissemination and advocacy, but also making, becoming the bridge of collaboration between different uh, institutions and countries. We have many different programs, and ECROM, although I am here from the perspective of World Heritage, uh, the advisory body role is not the only role of ECROM. We have many different programs that pertain to museums, collections, archives, also uh, digital heritage, uh, sustainability, and built heritage, so built heritage in general, not just limited to World Heritage. We have different programs on uh, first aid and resilience that is to do with humanitarian support as well re regarding emergency crisis situations and also different regional uh, programs such as the uh, program on, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean but also Youth Heritage Africa and the Athar program that operates in the uh, Arab States region. So this is just to give you a perspective of the wider range of uh, services and programs that ECROM has to offer. And uh, ECROM, as, uh, as an advisory body, uh, we operate within the World Heritage Convention, uh, not just as an ad advisory body to, to be advising on the SOC reports, onto the strategic and the policy issues, and monitoring the state of conservation, but the World Heritage Leadership Program has been established to specifically implement different activities about training and capacity building, and also developing different guidances. So uh, the guidance that you see right now on screen, which is in relation to the wind energy guidance that you just saw in the recent presentation, um, this is the one that created the baseline for the wind energy. So if you are facing any kind of development, uh, this is the guidance that is the default guidance that should be taken into account when you're conducting impact assessments for World Heritage. And as such, we work on different resource manuals um, that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So obviously these are the different tasks that we uh, work within the World Heritage Convention, and uh, mostly we are the priority partner for support of capacity building, and so, which is why I'm very happy to be here <laughs> as well. And uh, within the leadership program, what we're doing is exactly in the spirit of management planning, uh, we're revising the different uh, manuals that are currently in operation within the World Heritage System. Before, it used to be natural heritage, cultural heritage. What we're doing right now is to merge them together because at the end of the day, whether it's cultural site or natural site, it's the people that have to implement and operate and be part of the management system. So in an uh, effort to make sure that this can actually be practiced on the ground, uh, we're revising all the resource manuals. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that while the guidance and toolkit for impact assessments was already published uh, last year, and uh, in, uh, it's, it is actually being tr uh, translated into Spanish right now, uh, we have the Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit, which is a management plan effectiveness assessment toolkit, which will be uh, launched next week at the General Assembly in, uh, uh, for the World Heritage Convention. And I'll be talking very much about that. And all of these guidances, all the, all the resource manuals that we are trying to revise is to really address the different silos and the gaps that exist. Because we face that a lot of the people working, a lot of our heritage uh, professionals working on the ground, they have specific expertise on archaeology, on architecture, on uh, intangible cultural heritage. But then they're faced with the aspect that they have to manage a place. They have to manage a place that have living people, that have garbage issues, that have traffic issues, that have different connections with disaster risks that have, have to be managed on the, on the ground in real time. And there is a very big gap between what we know as professionals of heritage and what we actually need to do on the ground facing realities. And this has a lot to do with the different evolution of the heritage discourse, 
The World Heritage Convention, when it was being made, obviously it was concentrating on monuments and sites and talking about uh, just conservation of material, whereas uh, the World Heritage Convention in the, in the midterms, in the mid-ranges, now started to talk about conservation and protection and really focusing on the issue of values and wanting to uh, take a values-based approach of why this cultural uh, site is important and the heritage is important. Whereas now, we're now sort of changing the trend into talking about heritage. It's no longer cultural or natural. It's really about not just about protection and conserva conservation, but it's really about management. It's about managing the values and it's about managing the people and making sure that it can live on so that we have a focus also based on value, values, but also based on people living there. So this is sort of the uh, way that the content of management is evolving at the moment. And that is why we are revising uh, the manual, the Managing World Heritage, which will be the basic sort of textbook of Management 101 for World Heritage. And then that will be connected to the Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit 2.0, which can be used for those people who are revising management plans. So if you have a five-year management plan and you are preparing for the next round of management planning, what you can do is use the EOH toolkit, assess what you're doing great, what's going, what needs improvement, what you might be failing at. Having the chance to assess how the management plan did in the previous five years or so and being able to then uh, reflect that into the next management plan for things to do. So this is uh, upcoming. And the benefit of having these resource manuals being revised all in one go is that it's a bit slow, but what it allows us to do is that now the resource manuals are all interconnected. Um, in the past, the natural site manuals and the cultural site manuals and then the disaster risk manuals, they were all sort of developed separately in silos. So if you looked through the different resource manuals, sometimes they would either contradict or overlap or use terminology in different ways, the same kind of word with different meanings. Whereas now, the resource manuals are being aligned all together so that if you read one, it makes references to the others and they are all interconnected. So that if you use a, one tool in one manual, you can also re, uh, apply and reflect that into a different process as well. And that all has to do with the focus on the heritage place approach. So what we've adopted as the baseline of all these resource manuals is that we look at World Heritage as a bigger place. We can look at this uh, park of the, of the great pleasure, of the, of the good pleasures. And, uh, and what we can do is actually not just look at the park itself, but look at it from the context in this, within the city of Madrid, within the context of it being in an urban landscape and being able to con uh, connect all the different elements together. And we don't want to make uh, the distinction that whether it's a sacred place or a marine ecosystem or a industrial site in, in a middle of an urban city, but the fact is that we cannot separate it out from its location and its context. So uh, the entire content of these resource manuals will be focused on how to make those interconnections, how to make sure that we can address the factors coming from outside mostly and be responsive to the context around it. And so the management system is now being defined as the combination of institutional structures, instruments, and processes. And I think I have to uh, really emphasize the word on processes, which is so important, uh, which was also highlighted in the, in the process of the 10 years of revising a nomination dossier. It's the process that really builds up the strength and I think the foundation of all management of World Heritage Sites. And it's the management system that needs to recognize that it's not just a plan, it's not a paper document that sits on a shelf that is important, but it's actually the interactions of the process that creates the management system. And uh, what we are trying to focus on right now as basis of the management plans and all kind of management systems is that it needs to start off from understanding the place as a whole. So in previous instances, when we talked about management plans, it would immediately sort of go into the details of 
management at the bottom. It would be talking about resources, it would be talking about objectives and uh, you know, how to implement and all that. Whereas now, the management system will be focusing very much on, first of all, understanding the context of the site, who are the people there, who, is, who are the communities, what are the factors that exist for this particular site, and what's the context that it lies in. And then, based on understanding the site of its values and attributes, which is the fundamental key point of the World Heritage Site, being able to then talk about the governance arrangements, about the governance of what kind of institutions, what kind of stakeholders and rights holders there are, and what kind of legal instruments there are to be able to activate these people together in the context of management, where we aim not just to have results to conserve heritage, but also to be able to have results that benefit society and be able to uh, bring us forward into improving the system as a whole. So when we talk about plans and processes of plans, management planning as a whole, we do really want to emphasize on the management planning process more so than anything else. So the plan is obviously a output that comes out from a planning process, and it's a document that is very important, but it's not really just the plan that we're looking at, but act the, the processes of the plan being made, being implemented, being monitored, and then being able to evaluate it and revise it for the future, and being it a continuous uh, set of actions. And the ma main planning instrument of the management plan, uh, it can have different names. It doesn't matter what you call them. Sometimes we see sites where they even call it a business development plan, but you see inside it, it's actually a management plan. The content is a management plan. It can be called a safeguarding plan. And it, it, what really matters is the type of content that goes into the management plan itself rather than what we call it. And uh, the management manual that is under revision and will be out next year, early next year, very soon, is actually taking that approach to understanding these are the elements that absolutely need to be a part of your management system that is addressed in the management plan. And I think it's not a, anything brand new for all of uh, the sites that are already operating with management plans, but just to inform you that the entire World Heritage Convention system is also driving towards taking a people-centered approach and really emphasizing on governance issues. And uh, the Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit, which is the evaluation tool, it's an assessment tool to see how we are doing. And it's a toolkit that consists of 12 different work um, uh, tools that you can use and with different frequencies. You don't have to use all of this uh, all at once. You can use it separately uh, depending on what you are looking for. But uh, it's 12 different tools that look into the different elements of the management systems. You can have a go at seeing if your values and attributes and objectives are actually aligned. You can think about the factors, about the, about the boundaries of the property, about the, about the buffer zone, about the governance arrangements, the legal systems, the frameworks and arrangements, what are the needs and the inputs, how is the processes actually being implemented, and at the end of the day, are we actually achieving the outputs and the outcomes that we had originally intended the management plan to be achieving. And so um, the Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit is uh, a, a tool to help site managers. We know that it's very difficult to assess what we're doing. And in a way, periodic reporting is supposed to be that. But then because you have to report to an international system, it's very difficult to get down to the details of a specific site. And it's also difficult to then derive different future actions, future uh, responses to the assessment. And this is a self-assessment. You don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to report it to anybody. So the benefit of it is that you can be truthful. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to make over the results, and it's an internal self-assessment tool. We also realize that these days, management plans are being outsourced a lot to consultants. However, consultants don't know the underlying, all the different issues that exist in your sites that you have accumulated over the years. If you go through the assessment first and then give the consultant the results, they have a much better 
basis uh, on to work off on to develop the future draft of a new management plan. So this is just to give you an idea of how the new management manual and the Enhancing Our Heritage Toolkit 2.0 will be in connection to the different parts of management. And basically, it's the different elements that consist of the management uh, system, which I won't go into too much detail, but very quickly skim over. And we realize that values and attributes, as basic as they can be, always uh, is the trump card um, that confuses a lot of heritage professionals. Also because the World Heritage Convention was not good at, at uh, specifying values and attributes for a long time. We were very good at saying this side is important. We were not very good at saying why is it important and which part of it is important. We're very good at drawing a map uh, with, with red lines on a boundary, but then not specifying what is inside of it and why it is that we are protecting it. So we really need to get better at explaining, especially to developers, especially to local communities, why this place is important and which parts, which are the physical parts that we think is so important that we want to protect because that's the basis of any kind of communication and in any kind of management planning, which we find that we, are, we haven't been very good at. And uh, it's, it's very, I think all of you have gone through the periodic reporting, the third cycle, and uh, we've been going through some of the responses that uh, came through with the values and attributes, and we still get when people have to list their attributes, you know, the physical things, the, uh, the objects and the places, uh, a lot of them just write cultural heritage still, which is, we find uh, slightly alarming and uh, a little bit difficult and there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, this comes in really handy when you're doing impact assessments in the future. We've had instances where people preparing nominations once they actually went through an impact assessment process and they understood what they had to defend against a development, let's say, proposal coming in, they had to be very specific. So once they got prepared through an impact assessment course, they had a much better understanding of what they could visualize as values and attributes because they were talking to outside developer sec development sector, planning sector people, and uh, it, it was a very helpful way to do it. So the values and attributes, it's the baseline of state of conservation, management planning, evaluation of impacts, interpretation, monitoring, and anything that has to do with uh, management uh, effectiveness. And these, uh, the different tools I've uh, inserted in as a reference just to uh, make the connection between the different um, uh, parts of the of the toolkit itself and once we go through the values of course there are many different types of values that exist in a place and what we really do want to emphasize is that when we look at world heritage management we realize that you need to have OUV to become world heritage but the management plans cannot only concentrate on OUV it has to address OUV, but then the place is so much bigger. And there are many different values that exist in the place underneath that OUV, which are equally important. It just didn't fit the World Heritage Inscription criteria. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's actually the baseline of the OUV, and that the management plan actually needs to encompass all of these different sets of values and the different layers of values, including intangible heritage, including different processes and knowledge and traditional ways. And what we do really want to emphasize is that we shouldn't confuse the economic benefits as values. We've been uh, using uh, the term values in various different ways, sometimes talking about heritage values of why the site has become world heritage against economic values, but we really should be talking about economic benefits and economic services that come back to us because we are protecting the site. Because the site is being conserved and being used as heritage, there are multiple different benefits, social benefits, economic benefits. The fact that the city, the people of Madrid have this fantastic park that they can all exercise in every morning 
is a, is a wonderful well-being benefit that is being provided back to the city uh, because of the existence of, of the heritage site. And uh, we need to get better at explaining these benefits to and, and actually outlining them in our management plans. So the aspect on services and benefits ha really have to be a part of the management planning uh, processes and being able to uh, remain, uh, make sure that the site remains relevant to the people around us. And it doesn't necessarily need to go into just the natural sites where they are provisioning and supporting and regulating different parts of the environment and social interactions. The, New approach to management, uh, the, the heritage place approach, which is not new, but we're just calling it new because it has a different name, uh, is really trying to take into also uh, account the multiple different contexts that we're facing. The context that Spain faces, that Madrid faces, is very different from what you would face in the Arab states, like in Saudi Arabia, it would be completely different to what the site of Hegra uh, would face, uh, completely different to a site w in, in Japan would face uh, in an island uh, of a religious site. And it's just very important for us to take note of the social, cultural, political, economic, and environmental context that reflect the reality of these sites into our management plans. And we're facing lots of different places that are uh, addressing demographic changes, not just in terms of numbers reducing with youth, but also different constitution of demographics. You get lots of foreigners, you get lots of immigrants. What happens when they don't understand the history and the culture that lies behind your world heritage? I come from Korea in rural areas. I go to neighborhoods where 60% of the population is no longer Korean. They are all from Southeast Asia and Korean is not the first language spoken there. How do we deal with those situations when we do not have the, the same baseline to talk about? We deal with sites in an urban landscape and uh, the historic urban landscape is precisely uh, the tool to actually address these is that once we start talking about heritage management, it's so difficult to extricate it out. You cannot separate it out from all the different things and the actions going on in the city government and it needs to be a part of the local government, of the local objectives and the local uh, uh, visions. And we have different political contexts. Uh, I, I come from Italy I, where I've been living for the past seven years and I'm sorry to say governmental changes happen more often than I would go to Pompeii, let's say. So uh, it's very, and, and these come with repercussions. Government changes, agenda changes, budget changes, the objectives change, priorities change. How do you deal with that kind of changing political context within a management plan? Obviously, we cannot say that a management plan is going to be the, the, the magic solution to everything, but it's really important to know that if you're dealing in these contexts, it's very important to have annual plans. You can have five-year outlooks, but then in these contexts, annual action plans are very, very important. Whereas if you operate in a stable environment, let's say like one of the Nordic countries, for example, and there it's so much more beneficial to have 10-year plans, that makes sense for them. And it, there is, it's just a way to say that there is no right way to deal uh, with management planning, that there is no set golden rule, and these, need to, these contexts all need to be taken into account. So when we talk about context, these are the things we need to be aware about, but then we need to be much more specific about the factors that we do need to deal with. If the context gives you the baseline of what the management plan sits on, Factors are the specific things that need to be inserted into the management plan that you do need to deal and you do need to actually have solutions for. And of course, we're not only dealing with different factors that pertain to disasters and natural hazards, but that there are actual possible inside, um, outside. Is it actually occupying a large territory or a small territory? Sometimes hazards, uh, factors such as dam developments, they happen 300 kilometers away. They happen in a different country if the river starts from a different country. But if you are affected, it becomes a factor that you do need to address. 
And in these instances, uh, we see a lot of management plans having lists, having lists of these different factors. But then what really does need to happen is to analyze those factors, find out who is responsible for managing that factor, and being able to find different management measures to address it. We've had different instances where we're talking about a port city, and the port city, they had a heritage department that had lots of dif difficulties with the port development as part of its historic culture, but had no relations with the port authority that was developing the port because it was considered to be outside of the heritage remit. But then as soon as they just started talking to the port authorities and started exchanging plans and different future developments, things started to change. So it's not to say that you are responsible for all of the factors, but finding who is responsible for different factors and being able to cultivate relationships and being able to have working processes established is equally important because as you may have seen from the periodic reporting, most of the factors are outside of heritage. They are not inside anymore. And we also need to think about the impacts that they create. We're very good at listing factors, we're not so good at understanding what that factor would have an impact on my heritage. If that factor happens, which parts of my heritage is going to change and how? That's the description of the impact. And it's very different, the factor. Having a construction happen is a factor. Is that construction going to affect my site with vibration, with noise, with more tourists, with more cars? That's the impact. So we have to distinguish between factors and impact and be able to then come up with different uh, management measures. And these uh, worksheets and tools, they're all in conjunction with the periodic reporting. So if you have been through it, you already have the good basis that you all have accumulated. And it doesn't need to be done every single time. Factors don't, sometimes they're temporary and change a lot but a lot of the factors are there for a very long time that we do need to just get better at understanding. And um, mapping attributes. Uh, as we go back to values and attributes, we see a lot of sites that when you describe the values of the site, you realize some of the, especially the older sites, the sites that were inscribed 30 years ago, 40 years ago, sometimes the important parts are still outside of the boundaries of the site, we realize. They were talking about this wonderful pathway to get to the center of the site. And the pathway was outside of the property area and the buffer zone. <laughs> and they were like, oops, <laughs> that, that was 40 years ago. And we haven't managed to update it yet. But we will still protect it. And it's the possibility to address those issues in the management plan if you go through the values and attributes once again. Because OUV does not change. It's, it's the rule that we made in the World Heritage Convention, but the values, the underlying different heritage values that breathe with time may change and may develop. And management plan is a wonderful way of being able to encompass those changing values and changing situations, I think, um, into the scope of heritage management and making management happier, I think. And uh, just to also to note that the protection of the, of the boundaries, the, the marking of the boundaries is not just a line, but really about installing systems, about how to protect inside those lines, what kind of mechanisms operate, what kind of legislations, regulations, limitations, and being able to understand whether it's adequate for the specific value and attributes that you're protecting. Here you see a weird donut shape of a mountain contour, it's because it's a mountain fortress. They need to manage the contours of the geographical lines and they need to map, make sure that all the defense facilities are included into the fortress line uh, of protection. So the map needs to reflect what it is that you are trying to protect. It's not just a mechanical 500 meters from the boundary of the wall or 200 meters. It really needs to encompass the values and the attributes that you're trying to protect. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is so special. We, we often lose sight of it, but the heritage was created by people for a reason and we really need to get better at 
thinking that there are people behind it and that it was created for people and by people and that we need to maintain that relationship to make sure that uh, these values are kept. And therefore, um, we're really trying to move away from the expert-based management. We have the values-based management where we do often still rely on a lot of experts to identify those values. But now we're really trying to step into the realm of talking about values as a whole, about heritage values. Experts are still important. They are still part of the diverse ranges of people that we do need to uh, connect with, but they are not the only ones um, that take part in management because people are part of the values, they're part of the attributes, they're part of the governance, they're part of management, and they are the ones who need to benefit from heritage. So it's, it's really one of the underlying um, aspects of all the different changes that are going on in the management uh, manual and the EOH toolkit. And when we talk about methods of engaging people, it's not just about posting a web article or presenting or having a conference, but it's also having about discussions, being able to converse, being able to consult, being able to have them actually be part of different processes. And in some instances, they take charge and the government supports and the management uh, offices support and becomes the, becomes the uh, assisting agencies in different instances. And therefore, uh, this whole aspect of understanding the heritage place needs to be the basis of management planning. We've seen many different management plans coming from different sites where it's almost a copy-paste of different plans that were supposed to be uh, uh, the exem exemplary best practices. We've really tried to move away from using best practice because every site is so different. There is no set best practice for any site, and that we can pinpoint the main elements that absolutely need to be there, but the best way is what you see fit. What works for you is the best way. So we don't want to see copy-pasted uh, management plans from you know, 15, 20 different sites looking all exactly the same, but those really simple ones that focus on the issues of the site and be applicable to your site itself. And that's why I've really spent a lot of time talking about the uh, heritage place, um, because then it gives the way to understanding who it is that we need to work with, with the actors, instruments, and the processes of decision. And governance is one of the key uh, parts that is being addressed a lot within the EOH toolkit. And uh, of course, we need to know that it's about who is deciding what. And I think it stays really relevant to today's theme because I know that there is a lot of things about who implements and who does what regarding management planning. We see a lot of instances where management plans are established by one authority and then the implementation sort of gets hand over to the local management office and sometimes there's a discrepancy and not a lot of consultation between them. And that it's, it's really important to understand where these connections can be better made and by necessarily just asking the right questions. It's about who is responsible for which part, who gets included of which part, which component, how is it actually being developed, is it being developed by one person and then a lot of people reviewing it. Is it being developed with different agencies involved? And who's paying? <laughs> also an important question, so on and so forth. So lots of different uh, things to be thinking about. And we come to the aspect of actors. And I have to apologize for constantly changing the English word for this. I blame all my English colleagues. <laughs> um, we used to use the word stakeholders a lot. And that used to be sort of the encompassing term to talk about all the people involved in management. But then came a problem that a tourist, let's say, uh, agency and a local community member, resident, gets equally treated, let's say, in terms of, of, of management or, or, or inclusion into different decision-making processes because they were the same stakeholders. They were all around the table. Each person got the same weight. 
Well, we realize that also with the uh, different discussions uh, sort of surrounding indigenous peoples and local communities' rights, some people have rights. Some people have private property. Some people have traditional customary rights that have been denied over the years, uh, historically, that they are reclaiming. And these people's rights are not the same as having stakes as economic benefits, let's say, <coughs> out of an investment. And that's why we had to sort of differentiate those different interests and stakes at hand. So, and also to note that in the previous management manuals and previous operational guidelines, site managers, management was not highlighted enough, let's say. It was always the state party responsibility, but never really giving emphasis on management. So the three groups of actors that are outlined in the new management manual will be managers, rights holders, and stakeholders. And all of these together can become actors that participate in manage, management. And the, and the managers are obviously the organizations or the individuals that have been um, given the authority, that have been delegated with responsibilities to manage the site. And I believe all of you would probably be managers of some sort. And then we have the rights holders. But then um, they can be having legal rights or customary rights to, with respect to the heritage resources. And the difference between managers and rights holders is that managers have the accountability for management. Rights holders, they should be part of management, but they don't necessarily are accountable for it. It can or cannot be, uh, they can involve they can be involved if they wish to be, but they don't necessarily have to be if they don't want to be. And, uh, and so we see the situation where sometimes managers and rights holders can be the same person. It might be that an indigenous uh, community member is also being delegated the management authority and implementing management uh, responsibilities. And then, of course, we have stakeholders who possess direct or indirect interests and concerns about heritage resources. And it's the difference between having a right and having an interest that we really wanted to highlight. And that if we are dealing with these different people, it's not to just say we have all of these groups of people that are equally all important. It's to understand who is important for what sense. And if we have rights holders, they obviously have to be more included into the management processes in different ways, then we include different stakeholders at different points. And the instruments, the legal instruments, need to be able to provide the methods of how to include them. We need to make sure that it's included in the legislations, in the regulations, in the, in the norms, in the, in the policies, in the, in the customary rules, that these different types of actors are being included in different ways in the different processes and that they give way to establishing the roles and mandates and the responsibilities. And of course, the legal frameworks we are very uh, aware about. One of the other things though that we do find is that apart from the legal frameworks and the customary frameworks of, of listing them and understanding what exists and especially those heritage legal frameworks, we, by taking a heritage place approach, we also realize that there are multiple different laws that can apply to your place. And sometimes the more effective law is not within your department. You may actually have to go to a next, next door ministry and say, can we use your law? <laughs> because your law is actually much stronger. We don't need to create a new law just for the sake of this because your law actually covers it. One of the most uh, interesting examples is actually the heritage impact assessment. We've realized that within environmental impact assessment laws, legislations, heritage is actually included within the definition of environment. We just haven't noticed it until now. <laughs> and we didn't supply the EIA people with the necessary details of what they need to look out for in terms of heritage. And it doesn't necessitate that you have to have a separate HIA law. You can use the EIA law, you can make it better. 
you can improve it, you can, you can have sub regulations that pertain to heritage or world heritage within it and make sure that it's covered there. It doesn't always have to come down to the heritage law to be dealing with it. And that also goes with disaster risk management. I'm sure all of you know that it's, it has to be included in the DRM plans more so than heritage plans. And that we see lots of different laws that have no sanctions. And I think the World Heritage Convention is also one of those instruments internationally that is a celebratory instrument, and it's very difficult to ask for compliance, but we know that in domestic and local levels, regulations really need to come with that aspect of compliance and uh, enforcement. So there are multiple different questions that you can use to assess if your law, if your regulations are actually addressing all of these issues, have a go at understanding it in detail, making sure that it's actually covering all of the areas, covering all of the aspects of the values and attributes, covering all the aspects of the different types of people that you need to deal with, and then making sure that the decision-making process is actually solid. Compared to this, you actually have a different range of processes established that can in invite different people to take part at different moments of, of, of a management process. So lots of different things to go through and from here on is the regular management. So I won't go into too much detail, but that the objectives of management, when we're looking at a management plan, the key thing that we look at is does the management objectives actually address values and attributes of the site? We see so many management plans that have lots of visions and mission statements that forget to mention why this site is important and what it is that we're trying to protect. So um, making sure that the management objectives of the management plan, of the heritage, World Heritage Management Plan, does stay true to the basis of values and attributes. Making sure that we are actually, we know what we have Oftentimes we see sites that say, oh, we're always in short of budget. We need more budget. We need more budget. Lots of the cases we find, those sites that have too much budget are the ones that have problems. <laughs> it's rarely the case that sites that have less budget have, have too, too many problems. They have smaller problems. When sites have too much budget, they have bigger problems oftentimes. Um, so it's... And, and many times we also see sometimes programs or sites that have too much budget but that don't have the capacity to use it creates a lot of difficulties. You need to have the human capacity. You need to know what the type of people you want, what's the type of knowledge you need. And these are the things that take time to build up. And there are different um, resources that you can use to think about what are the qualities of people that you need. Do I need a manager? Do I need a finance manager? Do I need an architect? Do I need a landscape manager? What level, seniority? How much importance should I give these people responsibilities? And be able to include them into the management plan. And that the management plan we find, not just addressing the values and attributes and the objectives, actually addressing your factors of that particular site, Describing in detail how you will address those factors through different actions and that it is broken down in, down in terms of time aspects. We see lots of management plans aiming for many different objectives and almost impossible outcomes because they're aspirational. Management plan is no longer a plan until you have this detailed budget breakdown, detailed breakdown of what you want to put in, what you have at hand, what is available to you, but maybe it's available also to the EU. It's available to maybe the, the local administration, not so, not so much the Ministry of Culture. How do we make sure that these are all aligned in the management plan of the practical place? And being able to have desired outcomes. Desired outcomes that are very specific within the scheme of the management plan itself so that you can actually monitor whether or not you've been effective and that you can also put that management plan within the framework of a planning framework that the management plan is not separate, it's not just for your site only, but it sits within the 
planning framework of the city of Madrid, that it sits within the national framework of the Spanish Ministry of Culture, that within the management plan you have links to the disaster risk management plans of your specific site. Or you may have different tourism management plans or interpretation plans, but they all need to speak to each other. So the management plan is not a single document that sits alone, but is really um, in contact con connection with everything else. And that with the annual plans, action plans, you implement, but that you immediately start to monitor as well. The monitoring program to be able to track what you are doing needs to be there from the outset of management planning and that it gives you the possibility to adjust according to the implementation. It's not to say you did bad because you didn't do everything <laughs> you planned out. It's to say, okay, we aimed for too much, let's adjust. Or we aimed for too little, let's adjust. Make it realistic so that it's a useful thing. And that there's always that element of evaluation at the end, making sure that you have time to elaborate a new plan and being able to finalize by saying, did we do a good job at protecting the heritage? Because that was our original objective of having a management plan. Did we actually do everything that we wanted to do? And did that action actually contribute to the protection of the site? And when we talk about monitoring, it's again starting with the attributes. You have to know what kind of indicators you want to established to be able to track those attributes. And then, once you have those indicators, we need to know what's the uh, threshold of this indicator. If you're monitoring temperature, for example, if the temperature goes above 40 degrees, you have to have, you need to activate an action. That needs to be part of the monitoring program. You need to have that threshold established, not just about continuously collecting temperature numbers, but knowing when you need to take action and understanding when it has uh, a re reached a limit and then being able to be realistic about who is going to collect those data, how often you are going to analyze it, and what are you going to use it for? And how is that actually going to be reflected into the next management plan? So the indicators actually have to be both quantitative and qualitative and being able to uh, provide reliable means to measure the condition of the attributes and achievement of both the expected results of your actions as well. So it's, it's the connection between the state of conservation of the site and of the state of how effective your management is. They need to be clear, predictable, it has to be fixed so that you can also track long-term changes. You can't change indicators every two, three years, otherwise it's no use tracking them. They need to be cost-effective. We're not looking for like magnificent camera systems all the time. Um, it needs to be really easy to understand and time-bound so that it does make sense. And that by collecting these and analyzing them, it's like going through a health check where you need to then put it into context of your own site again. Here you can con see that you can collect data about how a wall is bulging or not, but then you need to take it into the context of how much rainfall did we have? How much stability does the land terrain have, the soil have? Is this a area frequented by visitors so the soil has, uh, has loosened its integrity? How do we make sure what the uh, appropriate management measures are? So it's not just about collecting the data, but really being able to analyze it and utilize it. And that should all, at the end of the day, lead us to thinking about the results that we want to achieve. And we've got those productivity. We have many things where we say we've had five different meetings, 17 different people coming in. We've had 20 programs and projects being implemented. But at the end of the day, what we really want to see is not the fact that you've had 10 meetings, but through those 10 meetings, did we actually achieve the initial objective of being able to protect the heritage? If we were aiming for less fishing, did the 10 meetings actually help in reducing the fishing? And that's where we really need to distinguish between the outputs and the outcomes. And that's where the uh, EOH toolkit becomes more uh, useful to determine these things so that we know how to compare 
the desired results and the actual results. So that we hope it's not just about attributes and values and factors, but it's about benefits and that we can actually improve our work. So this, is, uh, this was a very much uh, explanation about the EOH toolkit. It's a, it's a whole book, so it's not necessarily very easy to understand and use while just reading it. But at the same time, it is supposed to be a self-assessment toolkit where you can use your whole office to use it together. And it's divided into worksheets and uh, uh, templates that you can use. And it comes with lots of explanations and questions that you can use to moderate those workshops. And if in any chance you need assistance to use it, we do have lots of courses and workshops where we do provide assistance to be able to use these resources more effectively in the context of your particular site. And that these uh, toolkits all speak to each other. So if you apply one, it actually automatically applies to the other one as well. So with this, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>